have to say, Victory Monday sounds and feels a lot better, but that is not what we're talking about today as the Detroit Lions suffer their first loss of the season in week two of the NFL campaign against the Tampa Bay Bucks, 20 to 16, the final at Ford Field. It's loser Monday, Hobie. It is a, <laughs> that's not it. the I same feeling, you know, yeah. not the same feeling. I, I woke up this morning, didn't have the same, you know, confidence, the same just <laughs> positivity oozing through my veins like yeah. didn't have that and ben morning. ben mysteriously called off at like, i don't know why yeah. 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 PM yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. there is this something is different planned. about you ken yeah. there's yeah. something different about this lions team but look at you i don't no. know what it is are you I, embarrassed I, to be here is that what the you know i woke you know because the positivity just wasn't wasn't there this morning i just i had to make a change and, uh, <laughs> this is what happened so i don't know it, it's yeah. just yeah get used to it so this is you trying to summon a win coming up against the Cardinals. It's like, you know, hockey players grow beards when they are winning in the playoffs. I shave when the Lions yeah. It was the beard's fault, but not the mustache. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. The mustache Dan is Campbell, not culpable. don't take accountability. It's Ken's facial hair. That's yeah. what it's got yeah, to be. Yeah, it's but guys, be. let's dive into this game. 20 to 16, the offense looked off to say the least against Tampa Bay. They had so many chances in this game. The defense made stop after stop, but also gave up some big plays at some crucial points in the game. What's your biggest takeaway from that week two loss? They're still struggling on third down. Week one, they got away, got away with it because they made enough plays in the red zone. But this week, same struggles on third down. Can't complete passes, not getting to short enough distances to run. And uh, the play calling was a little strange too because the Lions were running the ball well and they let Jared Goff throw it 55 times. So yeah, the struggles on third down with, with Josh Reynolds no longer here is the takeaway for me. Yeah, same thing for me as far as the run game. I, I'm not sure why we got rid of, away from the run game. If you look at the numbers, they still averaged five yards a carry. Yeah. There was uh, red zone uh, possessions where they didn't run the ball. Like I'm not sure what the idea was there. But it's something to do with Tampa Bay because last year, if you look at the two games Goff had, those were two of his four highest uh, pass attempt games. They did it again this week. I guess it worked last time, so maybe they – but at some point when you were running the ball so well, just stick to the run. Yeah, yeah it's got to be just the play calling. The, just the, the offense is in disarray. I mean, yeah. it really is. Mm -hmm. There's nothing – is, nothing is clicking together. The, the play calling is all over the place. Jared Goff is all over the place. He's, he's not reading the offense nearly as well as he was doing last year. He's – you know, the defense seems to know exactly where he's throwing it most of the time. And that guy's usually covered. Yeah. <laughs> and there's usually a guy open over here. Like Sam Laporta was open like yep. 100 snaps yesterday, mm -hmm. never got the ball. I mean, so I just, you know, it's really frustrating to watch. But it does, it, it does seem like the Lions came into the season with a really similar philosophy on offense. And then the identity has been mixed so far. Mm -hmm. And Jared Goff is acting like it's last year. And I think... It's, the, it's that shift that we talked about before the season. They're now the hunted, and there's a ton of tape on what Jared Goff did last year, and he's got to make adjustments, and he hasn't done that. Did anybody else notice, though, that he was rushing throws he didn't need mm -hmm. to rush? Not comfortable. Yeah. Not comfortable at all. Like th There was a play where he rolled out, and he did some weird roll to the backside shoulder, and then he had all the time in the world, and Sam Laporta opened the back of the end zone, and then didn't even throw it in a place where he could catch it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just threw it away for no reason. So it was weird stuff like that where he was throwing the ball – Early, he had an, another second, and he would have had the guy in stride, and he kind of th threw it and turned away, but he wasn't about to get hit. Mm -hmm. And so I, that, it felt very uncomfortable. Very weird, because yeah. it's almost the exact same offensive line, you know? And, mm -hmm. and Jared Goff is a guy who stood in there pretty well last year and yeah. delivered a lot of late throws, so... We'll get into golf in just a little bit, but let's hear from Dan Campbell. He took some accountability after the loss for the for the gaff before the half, where the offense was trying to spike it. The special teams unit runs out there. Just just very weird game all around. Here's more from the team after that L against Tampa Bay. You know, I asked for improvement from last week uh, was the story, and we did improve. We did improve, and uh, their coach cost him. Their head coach cost them this one. I think that's a good team. I think we fought hard. I think we didn't make enough plays. I think we had, you know, too many mistakes, and um, and they had less mistakes than we did. And and, and ultimately, at the end of the game, we kind of had a chance to win it a couple times there. But 
it just wasn't enough. And uh, they're a good team. We're a good team. It's early in the season. It'll be definitely a learning experience for sure for us. Games like this really help you hone in on the details because, again, like I said, like it, it felt like we were moving the ball. Um, but then when it comes down to the details of let's get the ball in the end zone, it just didn't happen. Um, so we had multiple opportunities there at the end of the game to go and win it. Um, and I mean, we just didn't do enough. They did not do enough. So as we sit here on this Monday, Dan Campbell, as we said, taking accountability for this loss. But who do you think takes the most blame after what happened against Tampa Bay? Dan Campbell is being a good general and going down for his troops. But while he does share some of the blame as the head coach, he is not the person that no. I'm pointing at. At most, he's third because the two guys who stood out the most to me were Jared Goff and Ben Johnson. Two guys who I am not worried about necessarily in the long term. I mean, we're talking about proven guys. Ben Johnson has been one of the best play callers in the league. But this week, they, the game plan and the execution just did not make any sense to me. Jared Goff looked bad on his throws, but what was more concerning was the lack of situational execution. You talk about the play before the half. They were on the 17-yard line. Why would you risk a throw with no timeouts to the middle of the field just to get eight yards closer? I mean, sure, he did get the spike off in time, so it shouldn't have mattered, but the risk-reward there didn't warrant it. Then you go to the final drive of the game where they had 33 seconds oh, left, man. and he's dinking and dunking the ball to the middle of the field. That cost them their last mm -hmm. timeout for nine yards. That cost them... 13 of their last 27 seconds for another nine yards. And then in the final three plays, they never even took a shot to the end zone. So it's not just the fact that he didn't throw the ball well. It's the fact that it was like the game plan didn't even really give the Lions a chance. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I just feel like, the you know, one of the keys to the Lions' success last year was that they dictated the game, mm -hmm. right? That offensive line, they controlled everything. And it seems like coming into the Bucks game, and even to some degree the Rams game was similar, they let the Bucks dictate everything. Yeah. And they knew that the secondary was beat up, right, for the Bucks. Yep. And even though the Lions are built to run the ball, they just decided, oh, we're not going to do that. You're today. missing Antoine <laughs> Winfield Jr. Let's chuck it yeah, down the field just, 55 yeah. times. But let's you're also yeah. missing Vita Vea, like when he went out. And Kalaja Kanti. That's two strong defensive the linemen. Ball. There was that point in the fourth quarter, I thought, okay, they were they were down, what was it, three? They were, I think, I think, or they, they had a chance in the fourth quarter to, like, start milking the clock. And I thought that, okay, yeah. this is what we're going to see, just like we saw last week, David Montgomery and that offensive line dictate this game, and that's where they're going to seal the deal, and then the defense is going to hold them at the end. That's what I the thought The boa was constrictor. Happen. It's what they did in overtime. Yeah. It's yeah. what they did to so many teams last year because every, time, every week we were getting on here and saying, well, it was ugly, but the Lions won again. Yeah. Well, it was ugly, but the Lions beat another good team. And this time it was like – it was like they had, you know, Jared Goff passing yards as a prop bet. It was so weird <laughs> yeah. to see him chucking the ball all the, all over the yard, all over the field when Jameer Gibbs was running mm -hmm. the ball well and David Montgomery ran the ball well so so well last week. I just don't understand it. I mean, I, I, I like, what is Ben Johnson doing with this offense right now? The the rush. It's not like the the running game isn't working for them. You know, it'd be one thing if if uh, you know Gibbs and Montgomery were getting stuffed and they were like, right. guess we got to throw the ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's not the case. The running game has been the key to the, to success all of last year, and it won them in week won them the game in week one, and then it was working fine in week two when yeah. they used it, and then they just moved away from it again. And I. I it's unfathomable. I don't understand. And Jared Goff was quote unquote kept clean because they didn't sack him yesterday. But still, he took some hits. Yeah. I mean, what was it? Two two roughing the passer calls. Every time he would drop back, it seemed like he was getting some pressure in his face. And I've talked to you guys about it. I think that Jared Goff playing with a lead and Jared Goff playing from behind are two completely different quarterbacks. Something is different, and I don't know what it is. You, well, the, the, you could see it yesterday. You could yeah, yeah. see, you know, he didn't get sacked, but he got hit multiple times. And like we said before, the way he was kind of getting rid of the ball sooner than he should have, and in situation like dumping the ball over the middle with clock issues is not a Dan Campbell thing. This no. is a Jared Goff making bad decisions, and and I'm not worried about it long term at all because we've seen who these guys are. But I was just concerned. Like, is this now you have to worry about this Jared Goff showing up again? Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. you have to worry about. I had two interceptions. The first one maybe not his yeah, fault because not his fault at all. JMO looks like he, his, his route was impeded. But the yeah. second one though. He just kind of sailed it. I don't know if it was miscommunication or not, but that thing just kind of sailed right into, like, a nice zone coverage that the Bucks had and went the other way. It's what we know is Jared Goff's <clears throat> weakest thing, right? It, if he's not comfortable, he's a terrible quarterback. And that's what got, that's what got him ran out of L.A. Mm -hmm. I mean, last year it really worked because the offensive line kept him clean. He rarely ever got hit. 
he stood in, made the made the throws. The minute he gets rattled, he turns into a completely different quarterback. And uh-huh. even though he didn't take a sack yesterday, I mean, he almost took a couple sacks. He got the ball out, you know, well, one of them, he got the ball out perfectly into a bus yeah. defender. <laughs> what a throw. Yeah. <laughs> but once he, once in his mind, like he's, in the, he's on the run, even if he's not, like you were talking about, there was so many plays where he looked uncomfortable for no reason when he had a solid pocket, but he rushed the throws. And it was another one in the red zone. I mean, he went to JMO on the, on the front right pylon yeah. and he was double covered. But then there, yeah. there were. I, I looked back, and there, there were some other guys that weren't even done with their breaks yeah. yet, and he was, and he was rushing that throw. You just yeah, that was early, right? Yeah, yeah I, I think that, that was second drive. Yeah, second drive. Yeah, yeah. He's just not making the progressions. Also, he's not also the Sam open guy. Laporta, you, you brought him up. It was three targets and two Where catches. Is Sam I mean, he had, he had a nice catch on that drive that tied the game against the Rams. But aside from from that, we have. Rarely heard Sam Laporta's name called already this season. There was a play in the red zone where a pass play where Sam Laporta was kept in to, for to extra block. protection. Yeah. Like, w- what are we? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah. They'll never like, see the, it. Come. Part of the, part of the thing about not having enough receivers was you had Sam Laporta, right. mm-hmm. but if you're going to use them to block, and that's not his best feature. Let's be honest. Like there were multiple times yesterday where run plays got blown up because Sam Laporta missed blocks. So uh, you're not keeping him in because he's a great blocker either. Get him the ball. I don't. I just. It, like you said earlier, it doesn't make. They don't know who who they are, what they're trying to do. They. I know we want to get Jamo the ball more mm-hmm. deep, which is great, but why are, the play action has completely disappeared? I, it, it's almost like they have so many weapons that they don't know how to share all the snaps. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, a lot of people would say that's a good problem to have, but it. It truly seems like a problem at times for this offense. I think that's the kind of problem that you have for a few games and then things get sorted out once Mm -hmm. everybody's roles kind of solidify. So, like I said, I'm not concerned, but it is it has been ugly the first two games. So it's something that they need to get fixed quick because you can't afford to start off much slower than, you know, one and one in the NFL. The, one of the biggest things that concerns me is last year the Lions' uh, strongest point was the, the middle of the field, right? And you could just see it. Teams are zeroing in on that, even versus the versus the Rams and then versus the Bucks. Every time Goff went to the middle of the field, chaos, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. absolute chaos. He didn't. He, they haven't been able to do that at all. I mean, I'm pretty sure two two of the picks have come from trying to work the middle of the field, mm-hmm. and then obviously the one who went right to the again to the Bucks yeah. defender, mm-hmm. but. That is that is something that defenses have really, really targeted, and the Lions have to adjust to that. They can't just keep throwing it in there. And Goff seems to, again, he's not going through the progressions. They're not adjusting the play calling, so he's trying to he's trying to force it down to the middle of the field where he's comfortable, and he's just going to keep getting picked off. Five times yesterday, the Lions faced third or fourth and medium, and Goff completed a pass short of the sticks, and oh, and, was... and the Bucks were just content to let them do that. Mm-hmm. So. I don't think every defense they play is going to be as well equipped as the Bucks are to play that type of defense, but the Lions were sort of falling into a trap where it was like Jared Goff thought he heard f- footsteps, dump off to Jameer Gibbs, two guys there to tackle him, fourth and three, you got a punt. Yeah. Stuff like that. So it's just the third down struggles just no no bounds, but you feel pretty good about them figuring it out. I, I know I, I hope you're right about teams not being able to do everything that Tampa did the whole season, but through the first two weeks of the NFL season, and something Kurt Herbstreit mentioned during the Bills-Dolphins game is a lot of teams are playing a lot more two safeties deep and making you beat them in front of the beat, – beat them in front of you, keeping short passes, mm-hmm. which works for the Lions for Laporta and St. Right. Brown as long as you're running the ball to move the linebackers up. And if you're not, then you're sitting guys immediately in those places where Laporta and St. Brown work the best. Yeah. And you're not giving J-Mo time to get down the field to where he works the best. It all is based on the running game, setting it up and establishing it and running play action. I am sure Hobie can tell mm-hmm. you the, the best offense in the NFL through two weeks the New Orleans Saints are also the number one play action team in the NFL through two weeks. Derek and Carr throwing darts, man. This is, and Alvin Kamara too. But, but again, this is the, not the, an run, the run and the pass are, are coordinated. It's a coordinated attack. I would much rather be in the Lions' position where you have the pieces to do that and you just aren't, than to be a team that doesn't have the pieces. So hundred yeah, percent. Sure. They have the pieces. They can they can fix this next week. They yep. just have to do it. I think they'll figure it out. I, I'm I'm with you. I, I'm not 
I'm not hitting the panic button at all, yeah. but I am surprised that we're here talking about the Agreed. offense because yeah. it was not even on our radar as an issue. No. No. Yeah. And when the defense plays as well as they did yesterday, yeah. the Lions should win every game the defense plays that well. Yeah. And, and come, we'll take a quick break first up, and we'll talk about the defense when we come back, especially Aiden Hutchinson, mm -hmm. who had just an absolutely phenomenal day, and we'll take a look at the Cardinals too. We've got that coming up on Detroit Sports Plus. Welcome back to Detroit Sports Plus, along with Ken, Ian, and Derek. I'm Hobie. I, I just realized I didn't introduce this at the beginning of the show. I feel bad about it's that. It's pretty rude, man. I feel like yeah. I'm a terrible teammate right now. <laughs> Especially since we can't recognize him. I'm, I'm new. I mean, I want like, a Dan Campbell uh, speech. I screwed my team. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did that, yes. <laughs> Thanks for taking yes. accountability. Yeah. I'll take accountability on that one. There you go. Uh, looking at this Lions defense, though, Tampa Bay's offense. I mean, Chris Godwin got his. Mike Evans had a couple of big catches. What did you think of that defense yesterday? I thought Sans it was, Aiden Hutchinson, because he was in a, in a league all his own yesterday. I thought they were great. I mean, I think the Lions are going to win darn near every game where they hold the other team to 20 points going forward. So um, there was the one drive where Baker Mayfield ran the ball pretty well against them, but those were some broken plays where they still got pressure. So, yeah, I was very encouraged by the defense. I, I'm happy with it. I don't think you can ask for anything more. I mean, they put them in a position to win. Uh, they held Baker Mayfield to fewer than 200 yards through the air. Uh, they, they stopped the run game. They held Mike Evans to like three catches or something like that, three or four catches. Uh, in any other scenario, the Lions probably win that game. Uh, so that's what you need from your defense. Put, put, your, put your team in the best position to win, and they were right there. Yeah, Aiden was obviously amazing, but I thought Brian Branch was also really, yep. really good yesterday. The interception, the w the one play that we won't talk about ever again after this week was the the touchdown deflection on the play action at the, in, on the first drive right after the p pass interference. I thought that was an amazing play yeah. by him, and he just sets the tone for that defense all over the field. Now, I will say the fact that Chris Godwin, the week after Cooper Cup got his, like there's an issue there somewhere mm -hmm. with like whether it's your number one or number two, yeah. whoever it Somebody's is. Somebody's getting loose. Somebody's getting loose. One, you're going to stop one guy, but you're having trouble stopping the other guy. That's a pattern here through two Do weeks. Do the Cardinals have any good young receivers? Mm. Uh, I can't think. Mm. <laughs> I kind of wish Larry he... Larry Fitzgerald. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'm glad he did it last week, and hopefully he doesn't do it this week, yeah. so it's not like a uh, shock to anybody, but yeah. they better uh, figure out how to stop him. A another good note for that defense, too. They shut down the run. Baker Mayfield oh, was yeah. the Bucks leading rusher with 35 yards. And as you said, most of that came on the scramble. The, the one play that sticks out to me, aside from the Terry on Arnold pass interference on the first drive of the game, is the one where Chris Godwin was wide open. Yeah, that was... Like that, that was just, I, I didn't know if it was, it was a busted coverage. Yeah, it just, just looked like a busted been. coverage. Jack Campbell looked like he was floating back. The safety went to the middle of the field, and Godwin was well, wide Arnold, open. Yeah, yeah, Arnold went with, with Evans, mm -hmm. and then whoever the nickel was went to the swing pass. And I, I don't that think was that was his responsibility. He was supposed to be with Godwin. Yeah. Campbell yeah. was supposed to be on the swing pass. So it just looked like a bust. That was coverage. incredible play design, though. Yeah, I mean, it really it, was. It looked like Same Godwin guys, was though. going to block for a screen, and then yep. he just leaked. And, yep. and and at that point, everybody had basically Evans committed had cleared, to the screen. Yeah, yeah, Evans had cleared out the safety and the corner. It was really well beauty. done. Sometimes but, it's just a good play. Yeah, it is. You know what? They get paid too. How about that? How about that? They get paid. The Baker too. Mayfield running thing, though, like this again is like one of the notorious things with this defense being yeah. able to adjust the fields a couple years ago, not yeah. stopping running quarterbacks. The pressure was great, and when the pressure got there, it was great. Mm -hmm. But when the pressure got there and then didn't tackle Baker Mayfield, he was gone. Yep. Does Arizona have a running quarterback? Hmm. I don't know. Let's watch the tape. <laughs> It could be, but, but when they did get uh -oh. when they when they did <laughs> get to tough week. when they did get to Baker Mayfield though it was Aiden Hutchinson four and a half sacks one shy of matching the franchise record for a single game. Here's more from Hutch after that huge day that he had against the Bucks. I feel like I was just in a flow state, you know, and it was uh, I was kind of just staying very focused the whole game, and I think our rush lanes were really good, and a couple of those sacks were our D tackles getting great penetration, and then I'm just kind of wrapping off. He did his thing today and, you know, I hate we couldn't get a win for him, but what a hell of a performance, you know, go out there. A guy who, who is, I believe, one of the premier rushers in this league to go out there and really prove it and do it, you know. And, you know, that's just who he is. He works hard. That was DJ Reader right there, and he said that he is just an absolute beast, Aiden Hutchinson. I looked it up last night. In his last seven games, including the playoffs, Hutch has 13 and a half sacks. I That's think unreal. I think we are watching a superstar in the making yeah. right now. Not only for the for the Lions, but for the NFL as a whole. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, th those seven you games were, were against 
Yeah. Those seven, <laughs> those seven games were against some of the best competition, too. You're talking about the playoffs last year and then, like, the two Vikings mm-hmm. games. So, yeah. And the Cowboys, I mean, Aiden has showed that he was definitely – he should have been the number one pick last year. Yeah. That, that year, thank you, thank you to the Jaguars for letting him fall to us. <laughs> <laughs> remember, so. remember uh, him coming out of Michigan. People said, oh, I don't know if he doesn't really show up for the big game. His all hands the time. are too small. <laughs> His hands yeah. are too small. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he proved yeah, all that. How many interceptions, by the way? Like, oh, just yeah. the hands yeah. thing yeah. makes no sense. But he's so long. The first step, they didn't stand a chance against mm-hmm. him yesterday. That was, was a backup right tackle too yeah. that, that the Bucks had, but still professional athlete and he had a sack on each of the first three drives yeah. i thought you know uh, hutch hutch made it there but the the whole defensive line was yeah. really good mm-hmm. yesterday i mean between stopping the run and just collapsing that pocket it was uh it was fun to watch because we haven't seen i don't think we've seen a defensive line performance like that in a long that's time. why you go out and get dj reader yeah. and he was he was excited to get back on the field because for him it's been a long road i mean you have a quad injury last season you sit out all of training camp you get activated it looks like you might be there in the first game, and then you don't play. So I, you could tell that he was juiced up and fired yeah. up and ready to go. Hey, how about a little, how about a little respect for Aaron Glenn? All right, yeah, he's t- yeah. took a lot of heat in this town over the last couple of years because of the defenses. He, you know, maximized last year down the back half, half of the season. Yep. They became a formidable defense. They start helping to win games, and here we are, a bunch of new pieces. Players developing. Come on, man. Give Aaron Glenn some yeah. love. All right. It, the, defense, the, defense was, I'm just the defense was so good that it, it almost felt like a net positive game. Gain. Because if yeah. we if we aren't worried about the offense, then what we saw from the defense should bode like really, True. really well for the future. And also last thing on Hutch, it feels like that's the last big contract that they need to make happen. Like the Lions yeah. have extended Overall, all yeah. of their core guys. It feels like they have probably only enough money to do maybe one more of those mega deals. And he seems like the one who needs I mean, pass it. rushers are so important. Exactly. In this yeah, you, he can never you need be, one, but he, he is it yeah. right now. He he has to be a Detroit Lion for life. There's just not even I mean does well, nothing every, else. No makes debate. Sense. Yep. No. Every bowl, every Super Bowl team has a guy like him. Yep. So lock him up. Absolutely. Ten year deal. <laughs> Ten year deal. Get it, get it done. <laughs> All right, let, let's take a quick look at what's coming up this week, and it's of course the Cardinals. We joked about Kyler Murray, Marvin Harrison Jr. Those two connected on two touchdown passes at the start of the game against the Rams. What concerns you the most heading into this game against the Cardinals, a team that has looked really good to start the season? They put up 41 points against the same Rams team that the Lions had to take overtime to beat. My major immediate concern is Jared Goff. I just want to see him look good for a game, knock off the rust, and convert on third down. Uh, I, I, the Lions are a much better team than the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, sure, I think Kyler and Mar- Marvin Harrison are probably going to get their, their points and their yards, but the Lions should win that game as long as they can get back to the offense that we saw last year. One thing I think really helps the Lions this week is that they're so good against the run that if they can make James Conner ineffective, then stopping Marvin Harrison is not that big of a deal. But mm-hmm. it's you know it's Kyler and his feet it, that you right, gotta stop too. Right. Yeah. Ky- that's the one thing that they have never shown me that they can stop is the running quarterback. That could, that's gonna be a problem this week. It's hard to stop running quarterbacks though. I mean, like, there's no like defense out there that's like, oh, we're really good at stopping Lamar yeah. Jackson. You know, no, the Raiders so. look pretty great. This <laughs> this <week. laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, the Lions are better than the Cardinals. Let's not act like uh, uh, a very close week two loss means that somehow the Cardinals and the Lions are on the same <laughs> level. I'm not there yet. But, but if the Lions but, won this week and they were 2-0, and they scored on that last drive, I think I'd have the exact same concerns. I would, too. Yeah. I would, too. Um, <clears throat> but my point is I think the Lions will bounce back. They're really good at bouncing back after losses. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to be – the offense specifically is going to be wanting to get out there and correct this stuff as soon as possible. Bet, bet the over. <laughs> <laughs> great thank you i love the advice appreciate it uh michigan state came close close to covering it was 40 and a half they scored 40 you know who didn't right. come close no, we'll get to them Go oh, yeah oh oh the the other the yeah. other college football team in the big 10 here yeah yeah we'll get into that coming up because that is a team that is making a quarterback change heading into that game against usc boy do they can you look very inquisitive right what? there is it me it's not you. Oh, man. The stash doesn't get you a starting quarterback job. I'm sorry. Darn. We'll get into that coming up after the break. Time to talk some college football and some big news in Ann Arbor today from Sharon Moore making a change at the quarterback position. Alex Orgy, he says, is moving into the starting QB spot. He has only six pass attempts all season, 10 
rushing attempts all season. Davis Warren, of course, had three interceptions in this last game that they played. Is this the winning move for the Wolverines moving forward, especially against USC? I think Michigan needed more more than this, probably, <laughs> but it's it's a move that had to be made. Um, the Davis Warren experiment was it all his fault? No. Um, was it a lot his fault? Yes. He just it just wasn't working out. You can't throw six picks in three games. Um, you can't have the mistakes that he made against a team like Arkansas State and then expect to turn around and beat USC. Um, at the very least, Michigan has nothing to lose. I don't think the quarterback position can get worse. Um, at least. Alex Orgy gives you another dimension. And it's something that Michigan hasn't used in any of their first three games, so it's something that USC has to worry about. That said, he hasn't you... shown much in the passing dimension, though. <laughs> no, he's shown that he's bad in the passing dimension. I mean, <laughs> So does that make him a two-dimensional quarterback? Well, no, it's, it's, it's better to have one dimension than no dimensions. So, <laughs> so you could just run every single time. I, I don't it's know. It's not the worst idea if you've okay. watched them play so far. Is it, better to okay. run, is it better to run the option or to just kneel? You know, like Michigan's <laughs> offense was, has been so <laughs> That's bad. That's where we're at. Okay. Yeah. Michigan's I mean, offense it's been, been so, so bad. bad that I almost enjoyed watching Jared Goff yesterday, you know? Like, oh. oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It, we don't have a lot of great quarterbacking going on in this town right now. But look, it's – the problem with Michigan needed to be fixed four months ago. Yeah. That's in the, the transfer thing. portal? And, yeah. and, I, and yeah. I'm so tired of hearing people tell me that Michigan couldn't do it because Jim Harbaugh left at a random time and J.J. Get McCarthy took too long to make his decision. These guys don't care about any of that. Just there's, show them the friggin' money. They don't care who the there's coach There's no is. penalty for tampering. None. Do you think Michigan would rather get the like Kirk Ferentz? Like, like Michigan cares if there is, obviously. Do you think <laughs> Michigan would rather have the Kirk Ferentz one-game suspension and a stud quarterback? Yeah. Yeah, of they course. Would. Yeah. They would. Right now. He's still playing somehow. If you could guarantee me 2021 Cade McNamara, absolutely. That's exactly what this team needed. Ken and I just have our popcorn ready because I, what's, wrong with, <laughs> what's wrong with the running game, by the way? Like, what is... There's nothing wrong with the running Kalel game. Kalel Mullins, Mullins looks great the other day. Okay, I, you're right. I should have prefaced it. Donald what Edwards happened still to Donovan Edwards? Edwards? He still had a good game against Arkansas State. I think I Alex Orgy gives them a better chance to win because he's an actual threat to do something on the field. And that is something that Michigan is missing completely. There's nobody on the field. We talked about this yep. last week. Nobody on the field the defense is scared of. Alex Orgy could break a play. Like, he, he could. Davis Warren was not going to do that. Alex Orgy has speed. He's got agility. If the blocks are set up right and they call the right whatever option, <laughs> whatever the heck they're going to call, he can, he can break something. Yeah. And maybe once in a while he fakes that and he throws and – the receiver's wide open. Yep. And so I think it does actually help them a little bit, but it's not going to move the needle so far that they're just going to, you know, start beating be ranked guys right. all of a sudden. We played I don't three see games. It. They're two and one. They, they have to be the worst two and one team in the country, right? <laughs> I don't Offen know. About offensively, <laughs> offensive, not defensively. Defensively, they've, they've shown up. Yeah, yeah. Defensively, I think there are some issues. I think Wink Martindale is still learning the college game a little bit. But the thing about Michigan is that the offense just needs to keep the game close because at any moment, Will Johnson can make a game-winning play. Mason Graham can make a game-winning play. The pieces are there for this to be a pretty good team, but this is a make-or-break week because if you lose this week, you're done. And the one bad thing is uh, Colson Loveland left the game with an injury. Sharon Moore, no update yeah. on him heading into this game against USC because you look at the opponents that they do have coming up. This is yet another big one because then they have Oregon coming up later on in the season. Michigan State, who's still undefeated at this point in time. That could be another challenging game for them. I think you start ha you have to start taking care of business sometime, and it's going to have to start against USC. The schedule looks a lot tougher today than it did three weeks ago. You talked about Michigan State. How about Illinois getting into the top 25? How about mm -hmm. Indiana dropping bombs on people? I mean, this schedule, now it looks like if Michigan is going to be this bad on offense, you're trying to, like, find wins. Yeah, we were talking about this, this being an, an eight-win minimum team. That might start changing now. I think that the minimum has changed, but I still think the ceiling is there for, for like, a 10-win team. I, I really do. This weekend will determine that. Ian's face right there. I, I, I just – I mean, maybe Alex Orgy comes out and he's a whole different human being, but uh, 10 win. I, there's just – I just don't – I mean, I, I hope so much <laughs> that they – there's just no way. Oregon has looked – Oregon has shown some warts early this they have, season. They have. Yeah, and that game's in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Getting Dylan Gabriel surprisingly was not as good for them as I thought it was going to be. So because they've been squeaking out games the first have. couple of weeks. Yeah. 
But so, we're talking about Arkansas State and Fresno State here. Like, also, I just I just want to throw this out there. The Arkansas State game was a blowout. Like, Michigan destroyed Arkansas State. It was 28 to three when Michigan brought in their third sure. string defense, and then they gave up a couple touchdowns. That game was completely over. But the offensive issues are still there. Yeah, yeah. Michigan State, by the way, three and zero, taking care of business against Prairie View A and M. Now they have a Boston College team that got beat by number seven, Mizzou, and they have to go on the road to play this BC team. This is going to be a test because we saw them come back against Maryland, and I said this last week, we are a missed field goal away from Michigan State being 2-1 and one at this point because Maryland had driven down the field. They missed a field goal. Michigan State gets the ball back, scores a touchdown. Their defense plays well, get the ball back, and kick the game-winning field goal. Like, we're talking about little details here, but they still are undefeated at this point in time. How do you see that one going? Well, Michigan State looked, it was ugly week one, right? Against mm -hmm. FAU, we were like, what's going on here? And since then, they've done, done everything you could ask them to do. Mm -hmm. They found a way to beat a pretty good team, we think, on the road, and then mm -hmm. they went out and destroyed a really bad team. So, mm -hmm. Aiden Childs looks like he's a pretty good quarterback. He's definitely the best quarterback in the state. And now, <laughs> they're going to go on the road again, and if they can beat BC, <laughs> you're talking about a legitimate Bry Bryce yeah, Underwood is offended by the way <laughs> <laughs> if, if they can beat bc though this would be a state 25 win. team i think yeah, this, this would be a, a statement win because Jonathan bc Smith's is a team. good team they have a good defense this is their a quarterback is great too yeah. he is yeah. we talked about mobile quarterbacks earlier he can make things happen they're yeah. right there with mizzou i mean i watched yeah. that they game. were yeah they, they were they, they were almost, in that game they almost stole it i mean yep. they were pretty close yeah they just mizzou pulled away at the end but that's what teams in the top 10 do we shall see what happens also we would be remiss if we forgot about this team. Come on. High fives, Come baby. On. Who called the, it? Who, who said it? It's your turn to take a victory yeah. lap on Detroit Sports Plus. I love it, man. Let's go ahead. Let's Ta about. Round the bases. Let's go. Come I don't on. Wanna, I don't want to take a victory lap yet because we, like, this is so real now. Like, yeah. I don't want to just, you know, say, and then they, like, they're in, the Tigers are in this now. Yeah. And they, this, they have a, they have a really important series this week against the Royals. Uh, uh, they have obviously the three games at the end of the year against uh, the White Sox that are kind of mm -hmm. in the bag for them. So they're in a lot better shape coming out of Baltimore than I thought they were going to be. Losing the one against Colorado on the school start, that was kind of brutal. But take, who had them taking two games from Baltimore in this series? And then they have one more mm -hmm. series against Baltimore. So. I mean, they're in this. This is fun. This two, is what we want. Two wanted. weeks to go. I mean, it's been a long time since we've talked postseason baseball in Detroit. In the final two weeks of the season, what do you need to see from the Tigers, whether they earn a wild card spot or not? Yeah. Ken, you want to get in here or you just want to run? With it? <laughs> well, I think they got to score more runs than the yeah. other team, and that's probably uh, what is going to lead them to victory. Uh, no, hey, I like baseball, all yeah. right? <laughs> it's just not my top two sports okay <laughs> listen after the trade deadline i sat here on this show and i told you guys that i don't care about the tigers anymore for the rest of the season i was wrong fellas. <laughs> i was wrong I accountability care. i care <laughs> i've been following i've been following the playoff run ever since ian broke down his ridiculous conspiracy theory yeah. about the playoffs which is coming to fruition i'm i'm locked in man i'm locked yeah. in so i mean I, why not why Here, not us? Here's what I'll say. The Tigers are the best team in the American League since the All-Star break. So this is not a fluke. This is a team that is capable of winning a series in Kansas City, winning a series in Baltimore, and coming home for six more games with an actual chance to make the playoffs. I looked at the Twins' schedule today. They've got 13 games left. They've got, some, they've got a four-game series against Cleveland on the road, That's and then three awesome. in Boston. That's, That's a awesome. key seven games right there. If the Twins go seven and six down the stretch, the Tigers have to go 10 and two. I don't think that that's necessarily realistic. There's it's no way doable, but it's not. Six. So we need the twins to give us a little bit of help, but that's what happens when you dig a big hole. Yeah. The Tigers, they, they, they're somehow piecing together this pitching staff. I, I don't know how they're doing this it. Is, they need to win these. That's the most the impressive end, yes. part of at all At the end of the right season, now. when we're done having the excitement with this, someone's got to break down what, what Hinge yeah. has done with this bullpen starts and the openers and only having, like, two real starters. It's like magic. But it is like Ian said, the Tigers lost back-to-back -back school starts against the A's and the Rockies, and they've still found a way to stay, not only stay in the race, but make up ground on the Twins. So, and I'm keep, more worried about Seattle, I think, than I am the Twins at this point. 
Oh, just, just based on the sc remaining schedule. Well, I, I'm worried about the Twins because of that lead and because the Tigers don't have the tiebreaker, so they have to finish a full game ahead of the Twins. That part. So they're that basically hurts. down by three and a half. Yeah. So the, these this next week, we'll know whether or not the Tigers. That's actually. important for people at home just watching the standings. There's more ground to make up than what might be there right. as long as the Twins stay can't finish home. tied. Can't right. finish tied because the Twins will get that spot. Yep. But still, it's exciting. Playoff baseball, September baseball. baseball. potentially. Yeah. yeah, this is fun. Yeah, and the team has been fun to watch. The pitching has been fun to watch. This is one of the best pitching teams they've had in a Parker very, Meadows. very long Ooh. time. Parker Meadows. Parker Meadows has been very good. Their record with Meadows in the lineup is something like it, 22 it, games above 500. Yeah, it's or absurd. Yeah. And Trey Sweeney has just been mm -hmm. this. I mean, I'll I can't take a victory lap because I I was. I killed Scott Harris for that trade, and I was 100% wrong. Now, I, I, so I far. Was, yeah, I mean, I would love to. I would still love to have Flannery in the lineup or in the in the rotation, of course. But they they've made good transactions at the break. And how about because at that point they said our decisions at the trade deadline are kind of determined by where we are in the standings right now, and the fact that this team rallied together and made it a season after that yeah. is just. It's been incredible. Great. It's incredible, but it's it's hard to say that having Flaherty would be helping them that I'm not much sure it would. because the because pitching the has is not been so the well. issue. Right? Yeah. Exactly. The, the the whole opener and then bulk reliever mentality is what sparked this run, as well as the young bats. The guys like Hanafi coming in and Brant Herter coming in and just being awesome right mm -hmm. off the bat. I mean, Montero showing up. Yeah, and having it's a revelation. Starts. Yeah, and AJ Hinch deserves a ton of credit. I mean, he oh, pushes hundred percent. Right yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us here on Detroit Sports Plus. Ken, you had something to say? <laughs> you, you. Where's Ben? I got to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if the, the Lions win next week, Ben will be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see as they get ready to take on the Arizona Cardinals. That'll do it for us here on Detroit Sports Plus. For Ken, for Ian, for Derek, I'm Hobie. We'll see you all next time.